right there. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the WonderCon 2020 Career Paths into Game Development panel. And we are gathered here today online to present to you this topic about how you, if you're interested, uh, can get into game creation and game development and what it takes to get there. And uh, we're glad to have you with us. So I would like to introduce our illustrious panel of industry veterans and uh, starting with Chris Avalone. Hello. Well, uh, as Kate said, I'm Chris Avalon. I've been in the industry for about uh, 25 very long years, and uh, I mostly have been doing a lot of uh, game writing for RPGs. Uh, but currently, I'm working on Dying Light 2. I finished up work on Jedi Fallen Order, and I'm also working on a variety of sacred projects I can't announce yet. And Chris. Hey, uh, I'm Chris Morris. Uh, I've been in the industry uh, about uh, five years now as a game developer and a few more uh, before that uh, as a journalist. Um, I uh, went to uh, DigiPen, um, got a Bachelor of Arts in Game Design there. I've worked on uh, Lawbreakers, um, World of Warcraft, and uh, now I'm at uh, uh, Sony Santa Monica as a uh, systems designer. Awesome. And Estelle. Hello, I'm Estelle Tigani. I've also been in the industry for five years. I am a producer at Santa Monica Studio. And before that, I was working uh, with Treyarch on Call of Duty Black Ops 4. Um, before that, I was at Fire Forge and Disney. So still still learning the ropes, as you may say, but also uh, had, a, had a very interesting path into the industry that I would be happy to share. Awesome. And Peter. And I'm Peter Allow. I've been in the industry for about as long as Chris Avalon has. Um, I've worked for Maxis, Sony, Sony Online, Electronic Arts, Digital Extremes, Crytek, and a bunch of others, um, predominantly in business development, though I started out in game design. Awesome. And I'm Kate Edwards, and I'm the executive director of the Global Game Jam organization, and I've also been in the industry for about 27 years. And I've worked on all kinds of stuff at Microsoft and beyond, uh, you know, Bioware and all these other games. So, um, and since my business here is done, I'm going to just relax here and ask the questions. So, um, so now that we all have an, a brief idea of what your background is, at least the short background. So, what I think a lot of people are curious about, of course, we always get this question when we do a panel like this, is the short story of how and also why you got into the game industry. Um, so you kind of gave a little bit of the bio background, some of you did, but if you want to elaborate a bit more on exactly what your path looked like, because that's one of the things we know is a lot of people in this industry have very diverse paths into this workplace. So anyone who wants to start? Well, I started out um, in kind of uh, um, an unusual way. I was originally a music major in college with a journalism minor and stepped straight out of college into a recession and was loading boxes for UPS when I got a call from Maxis. Um, they're the creators of SimCity and they literally needed somebody to help them sort boxes as they took over their own warehousing. And I took a three month job and did it in one month. And they said, wow, that's really interesting. Do you think you'd like to test games? And of course I said, yes, I want to test games. And they said, wow, you seem to be really good at that. Do you think you want to do uh, technical support? And I, of course, said, yes, I would love to do that and had no idea what I was doing. But after multiple askings of, do you think you would like to do something else? Um, I just kept saying, yes, I would love to do all of that. And the next thing I knew, I had a career. Um, I would attribute most of my career being uh, tied to just being genuinely curious about how does this work? Or how do you design a game? Or tell me more about programming. And then just jumping in and doing it. Um, sometimes I was awful at it. Sometimes I was decent at it. Sometimes I was great. But having a well-rounded education gave me enough to thrive in this industry. Awesome. How about you, Chris Morris? Uh, yeah, I think from a pretty early age, I just was like curious about how things were uh, put together 
and sort of like where that path led was um, playing a lot of games and, and being interested in like um, understanding more about how they were built. And that was sort of like a black box for me. Um, and so it led me uh, kind of down a path of trying to, in any way that I could find to create opportunities to talk to people that um, were in the game development that could possibly like give me some insight into the process or how they got there or what, what it takes. Um, but even still with that, I was still kind of like um, lost and confused. Like the uh, doing uh, games journalism was sort of my avenue to explore that some more, go to uh, places like GDC and to E3 and stuff like that. Um, but I'd also read about uh, DigiPen in like a Game Pro magazine, I think from, I don't know, maybe 1995 even. It was definitely an old issue. I actually have it on the wall in the cafeteria there. Um, and somehow that just bubbled back up to the surface for me, like in my uh, early 20s. And I decided to move up to Washington. I hadn't even applied yet. Um, and just like take my chances, like sort of no plan, uh, no plan B. Um, and went through that <laughs> process, which was like quite grueling, but taught me a lot about development, about working with people, about the things um, in game development that I was interested in and passionate about. Uh, taught me how to learn better uh, and solve problems and be uh, excited about problem solving. And uh, I sort of segued that into um, seeking out some internships. I did one at Blizzard on. Um, World of Warcraft, uh, Warlords of Draenor expansion. I went and worked at a startup called Boss Key. Um, I worked on a shooter called Lawbreakers that unfortunately failed. Um, went back to Blizzard, shipped uh, another expansion, which was um, Battle for Azeroth. And then eventually that took me to my current role um, at Sony, um, where I'm still sort of just feel like I'm figuring everything out. Um, but it's it's cool to kind of look back and see the foundation that um that i've been able to build that on that's awesome how about you estelle so i'm from australia and uh definitely when i was still living in australia the industry was very small if if not uh, it didn't really exist yet at all when i was in high school you know the idea of getting a game you know doing a games degree after high school was almost you know non-existent but i did dig around and i did uh, end up at rmit university in a games degree and my parents kind of joked that if it doesn't work out you can get into graphic design or advertising or something similar <laughs> so um I remember vividly, and this is now a memory that's worked out real nice for me, sitting in a, in a class in that degree and that there was a, a student next to me, his name was Parker, we were looking at the God of War 3 trailer that had just come out. And I remember turning to that uh, student, we both looked at each other and I had said, that is a studio that I definitely would love to work at one day, but it was so far from home that it seemed very much like a pipe dream. Um, but what ended up also happening, unfortunately, when I was in school uh, around 2011 and 12, the Australian games industry crashed and we lost 15 studios in my hometown alone. Mm -hmm. So all of the kind of networking that I did in the hopes of moving on to other studios, at least staying within my hometown, just became, uh, I just can't, just all fell through. So I needed a plan B. And luckily, it was Disney that had come to Australia, going around to different schools in the hopes of recruiting some international students to uh, their inter international programs and internships in America, uh, which would also help diversify the company, but also if they base them at Walt Disney World in particular, they have Epcot there, so there's a lot of international people that can work there and, and, and help promote Epcot. And so I took that as my ticket to get to America where it would, I'd be closer to the industry and be able to learn from people that I looked up to. Um, and definitely that really helped get me what I was, I didn't realize how big of a decision that was going to be for me. Once I was at Disney and I was interacting with a lot more people in the industry, I ended up leaving Disney, working at a startup company in Orange County called Fireforge. And that was made up of a few ex-Blizzard people wanting to kind of go out on their own. 
and we released a game uh, in partnership with Activision. It was the uh, game companion to the the Ghostbusters reboot film that came out, mm. um, and that they get the studio didn't end up lasting much long after that. It closed down, and I moved over to Loot Crate, which is a subscription box company that was also interested in getting into games. Uh, they had a small team of five people, with me as the only producer. We were doing mobile games and and just similar things to kind of add content to the subscription boxes. And in the end, that I was part of a round of layoffs for that and ended up at Treyarch where I worked on uh, with a, a team on the Zombies team for Call of Duty Black Ops 4. Um, that was, I think, where I learned all my craft kind of the, for the first time and really made a ton of uh, mistakes and learned from them and, a ton, and really experimented with how I wanted to be as a producer. After Black Ops 4 launched, I really decided to try to get into Santa Monica Studio, which had always been that dream from the beginning. And I actually had applied to Santa Monica Studio while I was at Fireforge and didn't get the job. So I thought I'd try again. And this time they took a chance on me. So now I'm there and I'm very happy. Very cool. And, and Chris. So I have a pretty uh, bad answer to this question because I get I get a lot of questions from students and budding game developers who are like, hey, you know what, you know what sort of college classes should I take? You know, like what was the what was the career path? You know, that brought you into like game design, the game industry. And I'm just like, man, it it was not that. Like it was for me, like getting in the game industry was just games were things I did in my spare time because I love them, whether I was playing computer games or whether like, you know, I was a uh, game mastering D&D modules. And I just did those things, you know, not solely because my players were lazy, but because I just genuinely enjoyed doing that in my free time. Um, however, uh, because I hate being unproductive, strangely for a gamer, um, I had all these modules built up over like about, you know, 10, you know, 10 years of game mastering. And I'm like, man, what a huge waste of time this is, unless I can somehow get these published, which I thought was a great idea. Um, so I tried to get them published. I submitted, uh, you know, countless modules to, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons guys, got many rejections. Um, and but I just kept trying. Uh, I got some really bad rejection letters. Uh, I, uh, I, sort of annoyed the hell out of Monty Cook, who is the guy behind uh, Numenera, and also he was a big part of D&D's Planescape setting, and he was so sick of hearing from me. <laughs> but uh, I kept submitting anyway, because I really wanted to do it, and eventually I lucked out because Monty moved out of his position and a new editor came in and said, hey, you send a lot of annoying scripts, <laughs> and we have a hole in our portfolio, and that means it's a marriage made in heaven. I'm like, yay. <laughs> and, you know, that was it. Like, um, once I got one thing published, uh, which, you know, it wasn't a lot of money. It wasn't, you know, a, you know, a big, you know, trumpets being sounded. But as soon as something was published with my name on it, suddenly a lot of doors opened and more and more doors opened until I realized there's no money in the pen and paper game industry. And I asked my editor, hey, well, you know, I'm doing a lot of work here. I'm really enjoying it do you know of like a more stable job I could take? You know, it didn't even occur to me computer games would be a thing. And then he just told me, hey, wait a minute. They're opening like a D&D division at this company called Interplay Entertainment out in California. You should apply. And I did. And I flew out to California and it was a great interview. And after that point, I just kept doing more and more game development stuff until, well, hell, I'm still doing it today. Nice. Very cool. Well, that kind of leads me to a next question. And, and I know from my own background, kind of similar to Peter, having a degree that has not a lot to do with games. I mean, I'm a geographer and cartographer, and yet I found a way to work in games, mainly because I was at Microsoft. And as I was doing cartography on products like Encarta, I eventually found that my skills were useful to the game creators as well. And so just kind of nudged myself over there and eventually ended up working on most of all the Microsoft games way back when. So to that point, I mean, having a, a d different educational background, how important do you think it is to have that formal education um, in a either specifically in like game design or game art or programming or even just having a general knowledge background because I know a lot of times we get that question from people starting out especially those who have a lot of amazing raw talent um, like whether or not they really should bother with some kind of formal educational path so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that 
I, I could start, I guess, from my perspective, I guess. Um, I, school was really useful for me because I was kind of like lost and confused. Um, I, I kind of had a goal in mind, but I didn't exactly know what that looked like, like how, how I was going to achieve it. It was very nebulous. Um, I didn't really have like uh, motivation to pursue it um, individually because like just the, the prospect was so daunting uh, of, of trying to figure out like what all those puzzle pieces were. Hmm. So having a place where I could go where everyone else was really invested in the same sort of like uh, outcome um, was really helpful for like uh, giving me like the uh, kickstart that I needed and uh, to give me just like at least a thread to pull on in terms of what uh, I could pursue and to give me like exposure to like options that I wasn't aware of and like I mentioned before to sort of reinforce like my love for learning and for um, problem solving. Hmm. But uh, despite all that, um, and, and like what I got out of it, uh, I think that if you find yourself in a position where like you're just on a regular basis, like you're, you're, you have a high output of like cool stuff and like you're, you're constantly seeing like growth and improvement in your skills and like other people are paying attention to what you're doing and you're able to like uh, kind of self-promote and uh, market, um, that, that could be enough like to at least start a conversation with somebody that uh, would be interested in um, hiring me. It's something I've noticed is like uh, very rarely in interviews, um, especially like within the past couple of years, really do I spend much time talking about school or even really do I uh, receive many questions uh, related to school. It's usually like, hey, what have you worked on? Like, what sort of like problems have you solved? Um, and they want to know what your um, sort of like process has been in like your your like last couple like recent years of like making stuff. And it's been very interesting for me to see that um, when I used to think that school was sort of the be all end all. And I don't know. I think anything that gives you like an edge um, competitively like is going to be helpful. But uh, your mileage may vary, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, I locked out on my degree because of the fact that the industry was so small in Australia. The way that my degree was set out was it was kind of, they made you a kind of a jack of all trades so that you'd be better suited for smaller indie type mm -hmm. teams where you'd have to probably do more than one job. So in my degree was every class was a different discipline. I did animation, I did rigging, I did programming, I did concept art. And that helped me later as a producer because I, it wasn't a deep dive into each of those disciplines, but it kind of gave me enough to know what is involved and, and kind of if I was to task someone with that, what would the expectation be and, and what would that be on that person? So that actually has helped me a lot to be able to talk the talk a little bit and know, uh, you know, what, what I'm tasking someone with. Having said that, though, I do believe and I've seen a lot of people um, specific to their craft completely skip school and just be, you know, practicing on their own time and amazing, you know, from since I was a teenager and just kept practicing their craft and managed to get in that way with the killer portfolio and no degree at all. I really think that it's, it's a bit of both right now because we have a huge number of degrees now being provided out there. So a lot of people assume that going the degree route is the way to go, but then there are some that are just naturally gifted and really good at what they do. I will conclude that for me, if I hadn't gone to school and done that, this, that final project, the final year project where I had to collaborate with other people in a group on that assignment, that taught me a lot of team building skills. And if I hadn't gone to school, I may not have had that opportunity at that point to have seen what it really takes because game, making games is definitely a team effort. You can't do it on your own. And maybe if I had gone the route of trying to practice at home without a degree, I would have gone into a studio unprepared for what's the, the 50% of it is being the team player and being able to work with others and collaborate with others, no matter how good you are at the craft. Uh, so I think it really is a balance. Hmm. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, I th you know, as, uh, as much as I feel like my degrees weren't a hundred percent, applicable to game design you know school does provide a nice structure for like you know uh, uh turning things in on time getting exposed to sources sort of outside your wheelhouse like i i got an english degree I'm, i don't regret all, all the uh 
the, the wider range of literature I was exposed to. And then also I studied architecture and that ended up being very valuable for just like drawing like, uh, you know, level layouts, whether, you know, in computer assisted design or, uh, you know, just graph paper for like whatever dungeon's gonna be in, you know, whatever game. The thing is, um, <clears throat> The uh, the only time I, I pause is when sometimes uh, students are just getting um, a series of courses sort of knocked out of the way, but there's really no end result they can show afterwards. Like I think I think uh, uh, Chris Chris your experience like with uh, with working in the teams and the collaborative effort and then actually having something to show by the end of it, I think makes a much more interesting discussion when you're at the interview versus hey I got my major in this discipline. But, you know, I didn't work with the team. I don't really necessarily have anything game specific to show for it. And I think that could make an interview end up being a bit weaker. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Um, but I was just going to say that, um, yeah, I, I, to Chris's point, when I was first starting out, trying to just even get internships, um, I think having the, um, the projects that we completed as part of our degree program that was like what was invaluable for actually like landing those roles because if i hadn't actually made and completed anything uh, i would have had nothing interesting to talk about in the interview i would have just be like hey i'm a warm body um <laughs> i want to make a game please pay me and that would have been like as far as the conversation went so that kind of uh I think that's where you get like a bit of a competitive edge when you have the ability to talk about things that you've um, been able to dive into. Because even if like you, th you go into the interview and you think, oh my God, I'm going to botch this. I'm not going to be able to give them the right answers. Ultimately, it's just like them being able to see that you can arrive at answers in your own problems is helpful to like instill confidence that you'll be able to do the same thing when you're working with them on a daily basis. Mm. And coming from uh, somebody who's hired a lot of people, I can tell you that the main reason to get your degree is to prove to yourself and to your employer that you can complete something. Uh, you, know, you see a resume and you see that they just stopped and, like, and you start to ask, would they stop in the middle of a project if it just became uninteresting to them? Um, I'd also recommend for anybody who is looking at their, to see whether their major is ap applicable. Uh, the nice thing about the game industry is that we are filled with so many disciplines and sub-disciplines that there really aren't many degrees out there that wouldn't make sense. I mean, by all means, if you can be a programmer, please, we always need more programmers. But uh, I can tell you that I've tried being one. I'm awful at being a programmer, but I'm very good at understanding what the technology means and how it affects other people's uh, groups. And that's a small little thing, but I've picked that up by having multiple paths of interests. Mm -hmm. um, I could list an endless amount of game designers uh, who had no training in game design. And the game industry is kind of at that same point that the film industry was in. Um, in the 1940s and 50s, where they were inventing most of the stuff that they were making rather than going to school for it. And there just wasn't school for film. So, okay, well, how do we handle lighting? Well, somebody can sit down and play with lights and try to figure that out. Okay, boom, now we have lighting as a complete major in college. Mm. Um, the game industry is still constantly evolving and no matter what discipline you choose to go down, if you manage to get into game development later, that somewhere at some point that discipline is going to come in handy. No, yeah. no, all all fantastic answers, and I I think that speaks to a couple of points. One is that you know a lot of people, everyone's learning style is different, and I think for the for most of us, having a structured environment for learning is beneficial and it helps us and i think it's at least in my experience it's a little more rare for the people who are like completely self-taught and they can do all kinds of amazing things and they've got a ri ridiculously perfect portfolio coming out of high school things like that we do see it every once in a while but it, those tend to be unicorn type people more than not and um, the other part too that I think is important to emphasize because we hear this a lot from people who want to get into the industry is they come from um, a lot of schools today where they 
are really pushing the STEM subjects, which I think is great, you know, the science, technology, engineering, and math, but they keep emphasizing coding and programming is sort of the gateway. And um, it's pretty clear from, I think, a lot of our experience here that it, it doesn't hurt to know how to code and program, but also you don't have to go down that path just to get a job in the game industry. And so, um, so to that point, I'm wondering what your thoughts are around like how quick and easy a path is into the industry, because we have people who think that, well, if I just learn coding, then I'll get a job as a game programmer. Or of the other alternatives, a lot of people say, well, I'm just going to go into QA and do quality assurance on a game and I will you know, do, do game testing and that's how I'm going to get a job. And there are people who've done that, but um, I'm curious about what your thoughts are. Is there really any quick and easy path or is it just uh, the usual path, which is hard work? Uh, I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, my my instinct is to say there is no easy way because when my mind even goes to, you know, try, try and get an internship out of school at one of these studios, even then there's tens of thousands of people applying for the top big AAA studio internships. And that, that's hard work to pull off a portfolio and do the rounds of interviews to land that internship. So I don't personally think there's an easy way to do it. Now, your point about STEM, there are definitely disciplines that are going to be more sought after just because of the nature that we would need more people in that discipline on a project. For example, for every, you know, a producer could be producing a team of 30 people. So for the 30 people, there's one producer. It's going to be harder to land that production job than the, the people that, that that producer is probably tasking. Um, whether it's the code and, um, you know, uh, any of those kind of STEM disciplines, I feel that they're always needed and we need plenty of them. And, and being a programmer can cover any number of things from being a tools programmer to actually working on AI characters and um, the mechanics in the game. Um, and then even designers need to be able to do some level of scripting. Uh, so I think... I think having some level of knowledge of STEM will open up a lot more doors. That being said, to your point, it doesn't have to be the only way you get into the industry. And I don't personally see there is an easy way to get into games. I think that the core thing everyone should probably know is that if you are networking just as much as you're practicing your craft, it'll allow you to set up uh, a good, uh, it'll allow you to open doors for when people are looking out for you to see if there's an opportunity or, or an opening. Um, I think networking plays just a big of a role than the craft itself. Mm. Yeah, and I'd, I'd, I'd piggyback on the on the networking aspect. Uh, and you don't actually have to like to go to game conventions or game conferences, although you know, although it does help to actually get that networking in. Like uh, I know when. Um, game writers actually ask, well, you know, how, you know, how do I hear about job opportunities? Like, you know, who, who can I discuss the craft with, you know, other than you, because you seem really boring. The, uh, what I usually suggest is like, Hey, well, there's plenty of, there's, there's plenty of like digital ways to network out there. Like, you know, you can sign up for the IGDA. Um, you can become part of the writer's special interest group as a result of that, you know, and they discuss, you know, writing almost nonstop, you know, and they share, you know, job opportunities. And that's a perfectly great way of networking and communicating with a whole wide range of writers without ever actually having to, you know, leave, leave your computer to do it. So there's plenty of opportunities like that. And networking is definitely an important part of it. Especially when it's hard for us to leave our computers right now. <laughs> uh, join game jams. That's a good opportunity to network and work on stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't envy anybody who has to find a new job in game development right now, um, especially when you can't present yourself uh, in person. So, um, you know, get good at your Zoom video calls, pretty much like we're all learning how to do right now. Yeah, you know, I agree with Peter. The uh, you know one thing uh, you know as, as as terrible as the the COVID situation has been, um, you know, I, I also hear from a lot of uh, you know people who want to be developers where you know, they ask about moving to certain parts of the country or like, you know, you, you know, will the company cover my moving expenses or like, do I, can I go overseas? Like, you know, how, how receptive is X or Y company to, you know, foreign applicants? I think one thing with the COVID situation, um, and I'm kind of curious to see how this, this pans out in the long term is I think 
it might be a little bit of a shake to the game industry that maybe you know a more and more remote working isn't necessarily an impossibility or beyond the bounds of reason and there might be more opportunities for game developers out there where like you don't have to physically be in an office for a long period of time you know although it does help um, but you don't have to be there for like uh, to contribute to games and be part of the uh, uh, the conversation for game development and I, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see how that goes mm. yeah I know my company right now everybody works from home and thanks to the multiple apps out there, uh, it, it doesn't feel any different than when we were all working in an office. Hmm. Well, yeah, that I would I would definitely mention on the on the game jam note because I feel obligated to as director of the global game jam is that if you're in the 12 to 17 year old range, um, we have something called GGJ Next, which is coming up in July. So if you and it's a great opportunity to have your first try at not only learning game, you know, how to make a game, but you'll actually have a chance to make one. So um, GGJNext.org. Um, so um, another another thing I want to touch upon just as we're we're going to kind of wrap up here shortly is um, basically kind of come down to what are the key pieces of advice you'd give somebody? I mean, you could even say, what would advice would you give yourself, you know, uh, however long ago when you were starting or, you know, what kind of advice would you give someone today who's, who really wants to get into games? They are passionate about the medium, but they just may not know exactly, exactly where to start. What would you tell them? Well, if, if I could jump in and again, I'm going to piggyback off of Chris's, uh, Chris's answer, you know, not, not to hammer home the, the game jam out, Aspect, but there's a lot of great things about a game jam notice notably the first thing is it's very efficient like in one weekend you will create something like as opposed to like you spend an entire semester making a game and obviously you will learn a lot doing that but if you do a few game jams you get a lot more stuff in your portfolio you like make a lot more mistakes under pressure uh, you do it in a relatively safe environment you know unless your co-developers are like mean vicious jerks hopefully they won't be um, and that's a really good thing to get involved with just from that standpoint like you can go through a lot of game ideas very quickly you can learn a lot you can build a lot of uh, friends in the trenches and all of those people are likely to be getting jobs in game development as well and you know if you you apply to one of their companies we'll be able to help you out so game jams I, I wish there had been those when I was growing up because those are a great way to get started hmm. one piece of advice uh, that I have been just discovering recently for myself truly um, is not to ever sell yourself short when looking at openings on careers pages online and you may not have to fulfill all of the requirements you should still apply and this comes uh, this to me personally was uh, like i said i applied to santa monica studio back in 2015 and at the time it was a no and they gave me really good advice as to why it was a no at that time and so i took that and i go okay i'm just going to keep working on myself i am going to keep practicing my craft and, 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 you know, get back to a place where I feel like I could apply again. And then I took that jump and I applied again and this time I got it. And so there have been other times, you know, even uh, when I was applying for Treyarch, I don't, I don't have, I don't think I had all the years of experience they were looking for, but they, but I applied anyway. And if your resume is buttoned up and you can speak to a lot of examples and to what Chris Morris said, you know, even going back to your degree, the kind of projects you worked on, you, if you can speak to it and you can show you're a team player and, and you, you really care about, you know, constantly working on your craft every day, then it, it will show itself. So I would not immediately sign off a, a no, if, uh, not apply for something just because you don't hit every dot point in, you know, the, the requirements on an opening. Mm. Mm. I think actually um, that dovetails really well into what I was going to uh, talk about. Um, I think if I had to go back and give myself some advice, uh, this is, I've, I've been given a lot of good advice and I'm fortunate for that, but there's one piece of advice that like I've never received and I like really had to learn kind of the hard way and, and still sort of like always am to, um, to a degree as well, but um, making sure to like um, pay attention to the things that you like really enjoy and that you're, um, uh, that you find that you're good at because it's really easy 
in the midst of like trying to break into the industry or to try to like um, progress and move forward while you're in the industry or whatever the case may be to sort of like lose confidence in yourself and in your skills and to allow that to like undermine you and to um, uh, have you start to make sacrifices um, on the things that you like or that you enjoy or that you're good at, um, which I think can lead to like not having a, a like fun, successful, like sustainable games career. Also, it um, gets you into like a mindset of uh, never being like good enough to mm -hmm. look for or pursue um, other opportunities that might be better for you or might help you grow faster or make you happier or introduce you to new people or whatever the case may be. Um, I, I find that with myself and, and friends of mine that I've gone to school with and uh, uh, many of us like fall into this trap to varying degrees at different points in time. And like um, the end result is, is generally like never uh, like good. Like you, you might be able to get a positive outcome when you kind of like fight through the pain and like come out the other side of it. But also it's a, it's really easy to get stuck in there for like an extended period of time and it can be super detrimental. And that's mm -hmm. something that um, as I've been like talking to a couple of people that are like starting to look at getting into games, it's like make sure to pay attention to that um, so that you can uh, be happy for like the long haul. Uh, I think it's just something that we just don't talk about enough given how, difficult this business can be sometimes. Mm. And uh, I, on Chris's point there, um, imposter syndrome is real. It's a thing that everybody in the industry goes through and top programmers I know are asking themselves, am I good enough? And that's a great sign for self-reflection, um, but it shouldn't be the, you know, what you lead with. Um, and the other point that Chris is make is, is dead on uh, correct confidence cells. So um, I wish I were a lot more confident at earlier points in my career. Um, if I could have given my advice to myself, it's the same advice I give to people now. Um, constantly educate yourself. Mm. Um, be curious. Try something different. Um, if you hear of a piece of software that everybody's using and you've never seen it before, well, download it fast and learn it at least so you can speak competently about it. Um, even if it's something that you end up never using. Um, the skills that are required in game development now are very different from the ones that were required five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the software didn't even exist. So, um, it's a constantly changing environment and curiosity and confidence are the two things you just constantly have to have in order to be able to build your career up and maintain it. Mm. All, all great answers. And I just want to, uh, I'll add my own two cents on this one, just because I mentor a lot of people out there, a lot of students, a lot of younger developers who are coming into this industry. And, and uh, to Peter's point about imposter syndrome, I mean, it is a very real thing. And part of it is because we are an industry that is, that is populated by a lot of introverts, uh, including myself. I've learned to fake extroversion really well when I need to. But there's a lot of people who are introverted. They, they're really nervous about networking. They're nervous, especially about their own skills and putting their work out there, having a portfolio. But in honesty, I mean, it, it's one of those painful transitions or processes that you have to force yourself to fight through and to find that confidence. And one of the, one of the biggest things that I see people trip, on, trip up on is this issue of comparing their work to other people around them. And I love this quote by Mark Twain. He said that comparison is the death of joy. And uh, you let that sink in a little bit. And, um, you know, if you're finding yourself, if you're a student or you're just, you know, sitting in class or you're at home or whatever, and you're seeing other people's artwork or, or programming skills or whatever that are just you think are so far beyond yours, um, you know, that's, you know, you, you can't dwell on it. You know, yeah, there will always be people who are better than you. But at the same time, guess what? You may have just found a perfect mentor, somebody you could reach out to and say, hey, I love how 
you did this. Can you please teach me? Or do you have a chance to, to tell me what software you used or what technique you've perfected? And, and really, that's one of the things I love the most about working in the game industry is that most people in this industry are so open to helping each other. They're so collaborative. Um, you know, so you just, but you have to take that step and you have to, you know, look beyond the, the, uh, the doubt that you're feeling by comparing and, and all that. And basically just reach out to the person and you'll probably find that they're willing to be a lot more helpful, um, than you might expect. So, um, on that note, we're going to wrap up now. So I'd like to thank all of the amazing panelists for participating and, uh, thank you guys. Thank you. And thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll see everyone at WonderCon in person in 2021. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.